Hello and welcome to the CEO Roundtable Bridging Asia. This is David Kim, your host. I'm founder and CEO of North Air Capital, senator at the World Business Angels Investment Forum. I'm also CEO coach and entrepreneurship lecturer. In this podcast, I'm interviewing the entrepreneurs and business owners of rising startups and SMEs around the world. I'm going to feature the people I find inspiring and unique and introduce their interesting war story and their tactical advices they can share from their own success and failure. I hope you enjoy. Today, I'm excited to have a guest from the very interesting company, Jill Oliver, founder and CEO of Hello Tractor, better known as African Uber for Tractor. Hi, Jill. Welcome to my show. Hey, David. It's a pleasure to be here. What happened to your accent? I was expecting beautiful Kenyan accent. <laughs> ah, I wish. I wish I had that lovely Kenyan accent. I'm, I'm from the U.S., so my accent is a mix of uh, Cleveland, where I was where I was born, and I spent quite a uh, quite a bit of time in in the Southern United States. So I have that as well. But now I'm based in 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 beautiful Nairobi, Kenya. Okay. So hopefully I'll have a some Swahili soon. Okay, <laughs> I'm so disappointed, but it's okay. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm disappointed too. <laughs> yeah, you can pick up some over time. Yeah. There you go. There you okay. Go. Why Why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and background? So uh, professionally, uh, I started my career in finance and uh, in investment banking. I did a little private equity as well. Okay. And around the time of the financial crisis, I made the decision to do work that was more meaningful. Um, so I started to explore uh, microfinance. I thought that was an interesting industry that was using commercial levers, uh, but in high impact spaces. Uh, so I started pro bono work there and while I was working in banking. And that eventually turned to full-time opportunities. So I eventually quit and, uh, and started that work full-time, um, traveling to all sorts of fun places. My first contract was in Afghanistan, uh, working with <laughs> a variety of uh, de- d- development finance institutions, the U.S. government, to capitalize the formal banking sector in, in Afghanistan to be more supportive of the formal economy um, and, and try and divert resources. Ultimately, the goal was to divert, divert resources away from um, the Taliban. Um, so this was kind of ISAF and some, some U.S. government involvement as well as the international community. Uh, but that launched my, my career in this interesting world of development finance and, and high-impact kind of social enterprises. And um, what, I, what I observed was that the global poor overwhelmingly are farmers, and there's just not a lot of support out there for, for, for people involved in agriculture, production agriculture in the emerging markets. So that led me to explore agriculture, which ultimately led to founding Hello Tractor um, some six years ago. So you already uh, graduated uh, from the toughest military boot camp in Afghanistan, right? There you go. There yeah. you go. <laughs> <laughs> ready, uh, you ready to fight in the war. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay. I will say uh, my lifestyle since I moved to uh, the first market we, we started in was Nigeria. Um, and I will say that is a very, I was in Abuja very relaxing um, place to live, very comfortable, very hot. But uh, as long as you can take that heat, it's just an infectious place. The personalities that you come across, the energy, it's an amazing country to do business. Uh, I would encourage anybody, if they have an opportunity, to spend some time in Nigeria, because I just think there's just, it's a lot of magical things happening in that country right now. Interesting. So uh, let's start with the icebreaker. Let's imagine uh, you just has had the best day of your life. What is that uh-huh. one piece of the, your best food and drink that will make your day perfect and complete? Um, so I would say the food, it will probably start with my mom cooking me breakfast. Uh, I love my mom's food. And so if she cooks me breakfast, she's probably going to cook me an omelet. 
and maybe a, a little fruit salad on the side. And once I once I finish breakfast, I got to play with my two daughters. I have two beautiful daughters. One is three years old. The other is eight months. And uh, any any moment that I can spend with them is a dream come true, especially a moment unencumbered by work and the day to day stresses of running uh, a, a early stage company. And and so that would be my idea of a, a perfect day. And I probably for dinner, I'll skip lunch, maybe have a, a smoothie or something. And then for dinner, I would have uh, chicken or goat roti. Uh, half of my family is Trinidadian. And so, you know, we, we eat a lot of curries. We eat a lot of, it's heavily influenced by Indian cuisine, but kind of a hybrid of African and Indian cuisine in Trinidad. And so I would, I'll probably have like a chicken or a curry goat roti or maybe beef roti. And then I go to sleep, maybe have a nice bourbon and go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, sounds very delicious. I'm so hungry now. I mean, how about the drink? I said I was going to have some bourbon before I went to sleep. I don't want to get too drunk too early. I want to go to sleep with okay. the bourbon on my stomach. But during the day, I try to stay away from the alcohol because I get tired, actually. I can't drink during the day. I One see. beer will put me to sleep, so I'll yeah. save the, the drinking for, for my nightcap. So it sounds like you're a very cost-efficient person, right? One drink, you get drunk. <laughs> exactly. I'm a cheap date. Yeah, very good. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so when did you move to the Africa first time? So I moved out here six years ago. Moved to Nigeria. I was living in D.C. And D.C. is kind of still home for our family. But um, moved out to Nigeria six years ago to to, op, to start the operations of Hello Tractor. Um, and then stayed there for two to three years, uh, two and a half years, roughly. Moved back to D.C. My wife and I had our first daughter. Mm -hmm. um, stayed, stayed in D.C. for about a year. Get settled as parents. And then we moved to Kenya to open up our second Hello Tractor office, which is where I'm situated now. In the first place, I mean, how did you get into the idea to start the Hello Tractor? So I was still doing consulting. That was my kind of interim career between finance and Hello Tractor. And I was actually in the Philippines doing a, a presentation to the International Rice Research Institute on commercialization of uh, farm mechanization within smallholder communities. Mm -hmm. And I came up with this idea of collaborative consumption of a tractor in an environment where farmers' plots are too small to justify owning a tractor, but being able to have reliable access to a tractor is just as good as owning one, if not better. And so it was that hypothesis that kind of planted the seeds for Hello Tractor. And for the first kind of six months, after you leaving the Philippines and, and this presentation to this great research institute, it, if you're not familiar with Erie, I would mm -hmm. encourage you to check it out. Um, CIMIT, the CGIAR is fantastic agricultural research institutes. Um, and for, for about six months, I kind of played with it as a hobby, this idea. Okay. And it, it just kept growing and tugging at me. And I just... The more I learned, the more I saw the potential, and it got to a point where I just couldn't ignore it. I was consumed by it and decided that it was time to take the idea more seriously and dedicate the necessary time and resources, at which point I quit consulting uh, and pulled some money out the bank and... Uh, and decided to launch the company formally. Yeah, your story sounds like a little different from the other uh, startup founder. Many startup founder uh, was telling me they came up with the idea or bump into the uh, someone on the street, and then they came up with a business idea. Sounds like you you, you have gone through the many preparation stages, right? Went to the Afghanistan and then research to the yeah. research project in Rice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe a little unconventional. Um, yeah. I think it's benefits to both, right? But uh, I kind of started at the macro level and then worked my way down to the on-the-ground realities, mm -hmm. uh, whereas a lot of people start at the at the ground, kind of grassroots level, and then they scale up from there. And I think 
that's probably the ideal. Um, my approach is less than ideal. Um, but that was the situation that I found. I totally in. agreed with you. I've been in the investment banking sector, I mean, 30 years and met with so many, work with and so many business owner. But most case, they are very good at the high level, high level business plan I model. Yeah. But when they talk about the ground level detail, in many cases they are missing. They, they haven't thought about that. Exactly. That's a typical yeah. issue. That's a typical issue. Yep. Yeah, good. yeah, and that was those were the hurdles I had to cross, and then I continue to be confronted with as a founder who is working on a solution that I didn't personally live. Right, I think what helped me was a conviction that I should be spending my time to do something that's bigger than me, and that can have a deep and lasting impact. Right, and so. It gave that conviction gave me the stamina to continue to push up that learning curve despite my high level of ignorance. And it's humbling too, right? And I think with the humility, you tend to be a bit more sensitive to market signals and what your customer is saying because you're not going into the problem with preconceived notions, right? So that's, that's, right. that's where it can be helpful, right? If you're right. humble. And I think the humility piece is a, a really important ingredient and something that I had to learn in my journey and continue to learn. I agree. I totally agree. Uh, when I heard about the, I mean, Hello Tractor business model, I got a two question in fact. Number one question in Africa, do you have enough tractor you can run the Uber type of business model? That's number one question. Number two is targeting the, helping with the smallholder farmer. Do they have, everyone has the smartphone to, I mean, run the, your app on the smartphone and then operate your yeah. business model? That was two question. I mean, would you like to walk me through the how your business model works and how you generate the revenue and customer? Wow, that's a loaded question, David. Okay, let me, let me pick that. <laughs> let me pick that question apart into some sub questions. <laughs> okay, I mean, so, right, so, uh, so yeah, what are we gonna, what are we gonna say? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the you're right. The volume of tractors in Africa is much lower than other parts of the world, which is what attracted me to this business in the first place. Now, it's important to point out that when we first started, we had technology coupled with a tractor that we were selling. And the tractor came with this technology that allowed the owner to better connect with farmers to make money with their equipment, servicing those farmers as customers. What we realized is that we weren't very proficient in tractor manufacturing, but we were on to something with the technology. So we decoupled the products and started selling the tech as our standalone product, core product. Once we did that, we we got really deep market penetration. And I think the, the product market fit is there and most uh, people who understand mechanization in Africa and, and mechanization across the emerging markets, not just Africa, but the emerging markets understand the importance of our offering, uh, which I'll get to. The challenge is in Africa, there's just not a lot of tractors to put the technology on, which means you can't, there's a low ceiling um, if you're just looking at capturing the existing market. And so our strategy for Africa is really capture existing market participants, tractor owners, uh, but also look at ways to grow the market, look at ways to crowd in more capital, crowd in more entrepreneurs who wanna own tractors, as business assets delivering services to farmers. The technology helps them do that. We sell a GPS monitoring device that goes onto a tractor and gives the owner full visibility into their fleet operation from tractor usage, location, tractor health and maintenance needs, to the operator's performance with the tractor, fuel. Uh, and then there's a marketplace where they can put that tractor into the marketplace and be connected to farmers who are booking for services. Now, to your point, smartphone penetration in these rural, rural farming communities is not as high. And so we often, the farmers often book through these community-based booking agents that use our app to organize demand, group the demand, so the bookings come in at economies of scale. 
and book on behalf of the farmers. Yeah, so so it's that last mile piece that I think is is mission critical in a business like this because and, and it's for multiple reasons. And you test on one: digital literacy is low, and cell phone penetration, smartphone penetration is low. It's growing at a rapid pace, but right now it's low. And there's because the demand is uh, small and fragmented. The technology used by these agents helps to group the demand so that tractors, when, when farmers do book, they're booking as a group and tractors and tractor services can be delivered in a more efficient, more profitable way. I'm not, tra- I'm not traveling as a tractor owner 50 kilometers down the road to service five hectares. I'm traveling 50 kilometers down the road and I'm servicing 30 farmers with five hectares a piece, right? And that allows me to make profits uh, while delivering this service that's impacting these farm communities. Yeah, yeah it sounds interesting. I mean, the, you you uh, have the agent inside your business model, so try to uh, bridge the gap, low penetration of the smartphone. That's a very interesting mm-hmm. idea. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's and and also, I mean, and I think the third value of that is no matter how evolved the world is in technology and apps and, you know, agriculture is, is a very personal business and relationships matter in agriculture. And it's, it's close to impossible for us to scale the kind of pen- penetration across these different, very diverse communities um, as, a, as a small company. So what we can do is tap into the existing relationship capital. That young person who's using our app to book services has relationships in that community. Farmers already trust them. Might be, you know, he or she may start off booking services for their family, right? My cousins, my aunts, my uncles, whomever. They're farmers. They, they trust me. If I tell them a tractor is going to be coming on Tuesday, they believe me. They're willing to even give me money up front as a down payment for that service to secure the booking. It would be very difficult for us as a company, especially technology enabled, to replicate that kind of success because we don't have the social capital. Can, I can feel that what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think it's an industry right. thing too. Right. It's, 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 it's a geo, there might be some geographic components to that, but I think more importantly, it's an industry thing, yes. right? In the U.S., North American agriculture is also community and, 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 and relationship-based business. You know, a farmer has his seed guy. He has his tractor dealer that he, and he's very committed and to, and they're committed to each other, right? I have my agronomist and I do business with this person. We have a relationship, right? I'm not just, you know, randomly downloading an app to take care of everything for me. Um, there's so many touch points that matter. Uh, and, and those relationships are, are based on deep, long standing um, social capital that's existed, you know, for, for decades. I'm familiar with, actually with this kind of story. One of the largest Korean group, Korean group, they started a farming business somewhere in, in that company started a farming business in some part of Southeast Asia, but business model made a perfect sense, but they failed to manage the farmer, but they, they don't have good communication. So later I am almost a bankrupt. So bank jump in and then try to find a guy who can solve the issue. Then they find out the Korean guy who was born in the Indonesia he can under he dealt always manages so many factory worker like fifty thousand mm-hmm. factory worker many many years so he knows mm-hmm. how to speak with the local like smallholder farmer or the yeah. I mean low educated uh, factory worker in the provincial area so he jumped in right. so he solved all the problem agreed to uh, hand over that business to the, the that guy wow. without uh, without uh, significant uh, considerable amount of equity he received the business almost free of charge. Yeah, uh, because bank needs yeah. to solve the problem. So exactly. Somebody need to. Exactly. I mean, who can solve the problem? He get all the benefits because other guy right. cannot solve it. So that, exactly. That, yeah, that I think a very uh, typical story that represent the situation in the like agriculture sector or the yeah. emerging frontier market. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I think, and there's a lot of value in that story, David. You have um, 
I think uh, underappreciation for those skill sets. Right. And um, but they matter a lot. And in many instances, your business success is predicated on having that type of talent and that type of understanding. Um, so it's, it's a it's a fascinating story. Next question is: uh, I don't expect for any business everything has gone well exactly the same way as your first business plan, right? That that's not the case right. for any business. So, how did your business model and value chain evolve from day one? Uh, up until today, uh, for the past five years, in in, in a nutshell. In a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm here. What do you want to say? Okay. <laughs> you are asking me some tough questions. Okay. I right, answer that. Okay. Answer yeah. that in less than a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so let me let me give it a shot. Okay. So when we started, when we started, we we were um, as I mentioned earlier, we were selling a tractor that was tech enabled, mm -hmm. that, that basically came with our tech, which was marketplace plus IoT for fleet management. And um, I think well, well, first of all, we we enjoyed no competitive advantage in manufacturing tractors whatsoever i think the but the broader more important more lasting lesson was we started selling this tractor because the research community uh before you know and before i started the company i was i did a ton of desk research and the research community from some of the best research institutes some of the best universities there was a consensus that smallholder farmers need small tractors that can that can that come equipped with a variety of implements to support the tractor across the production cycle land preparation planting fertilizer and chemical application harvesting and transport so we 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 work we partner with one of the top manufacturers of this tractor to white label their product for us put our technology into it and sell it as the hello tractor smart tractor when we went to market with this machinery, the customers were telling us in Nigeria, you know, this this tractor just does not have the durability for our soils. Mm -hmm. And one of the observations that our customers made was this is a tractor that would do really well in rice systems, wet paddy, muddy conditions where the soil is looser. And they were right. And the tractor did do good, but it did very well in markets like China and Bangladesh and Thailand and these, these markets that are really active in things like rice cultivation. And, but it took, us a while to, it took us a while to take that feedback and make the proper adjustments because we were so convicted uh, because of all this research from people that we thought were very credible. And I think the lesson there was that no matter how deep your conviction about your product, no matter how proud you are of this solution, see how the market responds, see what the customer feedback is. That is infinitely more important than researchers at Ivy League schools or you know top research institutes True. or the World Bank or wherever. Yeah. And, um, and sometimes it's difficult to, to make those decisions to, to say, you know what, Mr. Researcher or Mrs. Researcher, you're wrong. And this small farmer over here in rural Nigeria is right. But the reality is that small farmer is so much better equipped to make an assessment about a product uh, or, or a new strategy or new off service offering than somebody that we would deem as an expert. Yeah. So we eventually uh, decided to decouple the products and, and go with the a SaaS business uh, underpinned by the IoT. I guess you need a, a good local guide, right? Like a Sherpa in the Mountain Everest who can help you to navigate a jungle to survive. He could be a co-founder, colleague, or partner. Do you have any good Sherpa partner for you? So, uh, if so, sure. my subsequent question is, how do you guys complement mm -hmm. each other and what are the interesting synergy you found? So, we, we pride ourselves as a company on hiring local talent. Um, almost exclusively. All yeah. of our talent comes from the countries that we work in. That provides us with really deep, very relevant local insights. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I would say the way I complement my team 
because it's only a couple non uh, country of origin kind of staff on the on the Hello Tractor team. Um, and I would say my job is to create an environment where they can express their bit brilliance and understanding of the market and have the resources to t- translate those insights into products and solutions for our customers. That's my full stop. That's my job. And I think we've been successful in building products that uh, resonate very well with our customers because we approach um, product development in this hyper-localized way. And I think that's something special about the Hello Tractor and, and the work that we do and, and certainly something that I'm proud of. And as a result, you know, a, a byproduct of that, we have great professionals coming out of Hello Tractor, um, some of which have moved on to do some really amazing things uh, on their own with that exposure and, and that new set of experiences. So in some instances, we've been a platform or a launch pad for all sorts of exciting things. What are the biggest challenges at the moment? I think the biggest challenge is we operate in a very complex market that's highly nuanced and uh, but also undercapitalized. So we're very disciplined about how we manage our expenses because there's just not money pouring into this market or, or the sector that we operate in, in the market. But it also limits us in what we can do, what we can test. I think, and, and there's good and bad to that. The good thing is you're disciplined, you're smart. When you test something, you really want to understand what hypothesis you're testing, what are the underlying assumptions in that hypothesis. And if you have, if you find success, then you quickly go over to scale mode for that, with that learning. I think the downside is you can do less of that testing because you just don't have the resources to maybe run 25 tests at the same time. You just, you may have only, only the resources to do maybe four or five at a, at, at a time, um, which is, which is okay. I don't think we're going to, we're, we're not planning on boiling the ocean, right? Um, at least not overnight. And so uh, that discipline is probably more important than the the speed that we have to give up yep. because we're not flush with cash and, you know, like a your typical startup in a, in a more mature market. Can, can you tell me a little bit about the social impact in Africa you guys have been focusing on? Yeah, so we're, we're really focused on impact at the farmer level. So what that means or what that translates to for us is making sure our equipment is reaching as many farmers as possible. Um, so we watch tractor utilization very closely, the data points underpinning, you know, tr- overall tractor efficiency. You know, we have now just over 3,000 tractors on our platform, and those tractors have serviced over half a million farmers, which are data points that I'm really proud of and excited about. And I think we're only getting started. We're really at the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we think this can be and the kind of impact we can generate if we continue to incrementally solve these these this problem or this Rubik's cube um, I think we really really are well not only on this on the right path but I think there's kind of a Moore's law component to it where some of the insights now that you unlock have an exponential uh, level of impact what is next for hello tractor any uh, exciting growth and expansion plan you brought you product yeah. launching or whatever so 2020 was the year we were pushing into asia that got put on pause because of covid 19 um, but simultaneously we also launched a partnership with mastercard for pay as you go tractor financing which is a tool that will allow entrepreneurs farm co-ops to finance a tractor and as they use the equipment that we and of course we monitor that usage through our IoT and our our platform they pay down the loan associated with the tractor until it's fully repaid um and i think that's exciting because we believe that can unlock additional financing which is something that is sorely needed in our marketplace i assume that running a startup and making success in africa is different from running a startup in silicon valley right so uh, if you are asked to give an advice to young people whether they are local or foreign who are interested in launching a startup in africa what yeah. would you say are the top three skills needed to be successful entrepreneur in africa 
Yeah, and I, I can't speak to the differences because I've, I've never run a startup in Silicon Valley, so I don't, <laughs> I don't so know what that's I, like. I, 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 asked a, I asked the wrong but, person that. <laughs> right, it's my first rodeo. I've never actually started a, a company in Silicon Valley. Yeah, yeah, you can't imagine. Can. You can. What, what do you feel unique in Africa? Yeah, well, I, I will say this. I think um, the, the markets that we operate in are hungry for local innovations, there's a tendency for larger companies to either copy and, re and paste solutions or dump existing products or solutions into the market because they've been successful elsewhere, right? Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the, the continent, especially the multinationals, not having product teams locally in the continent, not having R&D teams locally based in the continent. And so as an entrepreneur, your competitive advantage is your proximity to the customer, your proximity to their problems, and your ability to translate the insights into solutions to those problems, right? And that can be incredibly attractive to these larger companies if you see them as strategically valuable. You may not. Um, but if you do, that can be incredibly valuable and it can be a, one of your most important moats to your business, especially in those earlier stages of growth. Uh, and once you figure those components out, you can quickly turn on the monetization lever because there's just a dearth of local innovation. And when you, when you just sit and listen to a customer innovate around what they're telling you, that might be the first time somebody's ever come into their market and done that. So there's a lot of white space for you to build solutions um, just by being present and uh, listening. And I think that might be different than, you know, in the Silicon Valley, maybe, for example, where you literally have some of the most well-capitalized people on earth sitting around thinking about what their next, what, what's the next problem I'm going to solve. And not only am I going to try and investigate what the solution to this problem is, I have a lot of money to throw at it. I think in our markets, you don't have a whole lot of capital floating around. If you're the one coming with, you know, some resources and open ears, it creates an opportunity for you to do something very useful. Um, and I think that's unique. I think you made a very good point uh, just now. Not many, very few global company try to localize yeah. product and services, right? That's a huge gap. Yeah. Uh, I gap. Think you're, you are right, right about that, I think. Yeah, they're just trying to sell the same iPhone, same Samsung, same, yeah. same thing to the uh, to the Africa. They don't, they don't really think about uh, about the purchasing power, how much they're willing to pay, what kind of uh, the I mean, technology spec yeah. they're looking for. They, right. they they didn't really care, right? That's, they don't really that's, care. That's uh, I think huge gap. Probably it's a young entrepreneur who, who want to be creative and then uh, communicate well with the local consumer. Maybe that might yeah. be a good, very good potential to capitalize on, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. And I think that's that's where the humility that I discussed earlier comes in. And and I think you even if you're from the country, you have to humble yourself enough to hear what your customer is telling you and as best as possible innovate around what they're telling you. And I think one of the benefits of being an outsider is you know, you know, you know nothing, right? You can't fool yourself into thinking that you understand the problem when you don't, unless you're just completely narcissistic, egotistical. Okay. Like <laughs> it takes a special person to come into a new country and just assume they know everything. Right. So as an outsider, you're, you're kind of at somewhat of an advantage because you know you know nothing about the customer and you know you have to be hypersensitive to what they're telling you because you're starting from ground zero. And I think right. sometimes um, what I see often is the people in your, that stereotypical kind of, I guess, quote unquote, startup environment or ecosystem. They tend to be urbanites. They tend to be middle class or above. And they're just as ignorant to the problems of a farmer 
as you might be as an outsider. They just don't know it because they assume that they're, they're, they're Kenyan or they're Nigerian and that farmer out there is Kenyan or Nigerian or Tanzanian or wh- wherever. It's a false comfort. It's a false sense of knowing about a problem that, that you really don't fully understand. And I think the same would be true if I went back to, to my hometown and, and tried to start a business there, I will probably start thinking I knew more than I did. And that could be a dangerous position to be in. I think what you just mentioned has become very popular comment. Many people actually have been telling me the same sentence. It's Is that very, right? Yeah, very dangerous. I mean, you don't know yeah. what you don't know, right? That's, I, I agree. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's a yeah. expression. Yeah. I mean, yeah, very, I mean, because yeah. as a human being or the uh, entrepreneur, we all agree that we are very self-focused, right? I mean, the, the more you uh, learn and the, the more you run the business, you become more and more self-focused and then yeah. you lose the capability to understand the others. And then yeah. and, uh, I think you explained about uh, the way the farmers in Africa accept the product, right? I, I yeah. think that we can describe whether logically makes sense or not acceptance of the buyer consumer is much more important right yeah at the end yeah, of the day yeah right. at the end of the day it's true so what are, what are the growth potential because i'm the, my park and one of the theme is i'm trying to uh, share the story from the entrepreneur around the world to the asian audiences what are the growth mm-hmm. potential of your business in asia and any collaboration possibility possibility with, with the asian business partner you can think of Absolutely. I think um, from a growth perspective, the existing market for our product, which is, um, you know, low horsepower, sub 100 horsepower tractors. These are the tractors that are purchased overwhelmingly by people who deliver services to farmers for a living, tractor services. In Asia, you got about a million and a half of these tractors being sold a year with no technology to support their business. And I think Hello Tractor is really that technology backbone that will help that tractor owner secure their assets, secure their profit, make sure their tractor is is utilized at a high rate. And I think that's interesting to dealers who sell tractors into these markets because that makes their product more attractive to the customer. I think it's interesting to the bank who's financing the tractor. It helps to de-risk, and they can also use the technology to monitor utilization, which serves as a a proxy for credit quality. Um, Immobilize the tractor if they need to under a default scenario. You can do that with Hello Tractor. And then on the farmer side, I mean, there's no upside there, right? We're talking about hundreds of millions of farmers that could benefit from services across the production cycle that don't currently have access. So... Um, in my whole, in my lifetime, we won't even, no matter how successful we are, we'll never be able to solve that problem completely. So I think it's a lot of opportunity in Asia. It's a, it's a marketplace we're excited about. We're, we're putting the pieces in place now to support our growth into those markets. And, and we just think there's a ton of upside, a lot of good we can do in the region. Thank you so much for the joining the show today. I really enjoyed the conversation, your interesting story. Hope to catch up with you again. And when you have more interest, more story and great success to share with us.